Now, I'm going to be talking this evening about uh, switching ARTs or antiretroviral therapy in order to improve adherence. And what I'll be doing is really giving you an overview of the strategies that you can use as a HIV prescriber uh, when you're seeing patients who might be having some challenges with adhering to their antiretroviral therapy. Uh, a broad overview of what I'll be talking about today will include really looking at some of the reasons for poor adherence looking at some of the reasons in which uh, we would be switching medications as well, including a reduction of side effects, reducing the number of tablets patients need to take, reducing drug interactions, as well as uh, food requirements and cost considerations. And I'll be talking a little bit about some switch strategies, including some novel techniques and strategies that you might be looking at, and then looking at a few case examples, maybe just to consolidate what we've talked about. I think it goes without saying that adherence to HIV treatment is of essential importance uh, for people who are living with HIV in order to uh, bring their disease under control. With highly effective antiretroviral therapy, we know that HIV is becoming a chronic condition that is manageable and people can actually uh, have a, re uh, a return to health uh, fairly rapidly with, with highly effective uh, treatment. Our combinations nowadays uh, result in very rapid, durable viral suppression uh, with immune recovery and, of course, a reduction in morbidity and mortality. And at least for now, uh, HIV treatment remains a lifelong prospect and in most circumstances uh, requires daily therapy. Although, as we'll talk about later on, this may not be uh, always the case uh, um, in the near future. What we also know is that one of the shortfalls of HIV therapy as it stands today is that even relatively short interruptions or lapses in treatment could actually increase the risk of developing drug resistance with a subsequent negative impact on health. And uh, numerous studies and meta-analyses have shown that non-adherence or poor adherence to antiretroviral therapy can actually uh, be a strong predictor for poor clinical outcomes in both the short and the long term. So how do we know uh, really that uh, adherence is important to HIV treatment? So in this study uh, published in, the, in, the clin in clinical infectious diseases in the early 2000s, we can see actually that uh, in two large randomized uh, multi-center clinical trials, uh, when we looked at self-reported patient adherence, uh, patients who, who reported 100% adherence to their antiretrovirals as compared to those who reported you know, anything less than 80% uh, adherence to their, to their medications, as I've highlighted in these two red boxes, you can see that there were drastic differences in the, uh, in the change in the, in the viral load. So people who are 100% uh, adherent were much more likely to get more uh, dramatic uh, reductions in viral load as compared to those who were less than 80% adherent. Uh, they were much more likely to be uh, to have a undetectable viral load of below 50 copies per mil uh, at the end of 12 months as compared to those who are not so adherent. And also they were much more likely uh, to have a more uh, a dramatic, a, a better improvement in the CD4 counts as compared to those who were less than 80% adherent. So I think we, we can really see the association between consistency or adherence to antiretroviral therapy and the outcomes that we measure uh, in, in our patients, such as viral load and CD4 recovery. Of course, we then need to ask ourselves, what are some of the reasons that uh, people living with HIV or our patients may have uh, to, to have challenges uh, in terms of their adherence. This uh, is a meta-analysis uh, of uh, numerous studies evaluating adherence to antiretroviral therapy in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, what we can see here in this purple box is all the various reasons that have been discovered in these studies, which are a mixed, uh, uh, a, a wide variety of mixed method studies. And uh, it's a complex issue with a wide variety of uh, factors at play, including social demographic factors, you know, including uh, uh, whether the treatment is at an urban or a rural site, food security, education levels. It can include psychosocial factors such as experienced discrimination based on HIV status, uh, health status, uh, treatment related things such as medication stockouts, uh, but also side effects as well as other facilitators and barriers. And we'll be talking about some of these in more detail. Now, 
uh, we also see that differing drug regimens or different kinds of antiretroviral combinations may actually be associated with differing levels of drug adherence. Now, in this particular study published in 2018, uh, we looked at antiretroviral naive, so treatment naive uh, veterans uh, who had newly diagnosed HIV infection, uh, starting antiretroviral therapy in the Veterans Health Administration between January 1999 and December 2015. Uh, adherence was measured uh, in two phases, adherence in the first 30 days and then adherence in the first one year thereafter. So in this table, it's a little bit busy, but I draw your attention to the uh, data in the two red boxes. Uh, patients who were initiated on protease inhibitors, uh, especially unboosted protease inhibitors, had actually the lowest rates of uh, uh, adherence as compared to patients who were initiated on integrase strand transferase inhibitors or integrase inhibitors who had the highest rates of adherence uh, in the first 30 days. Uh, and this is most likely due uh, to the side effect profiles of the protease inhibitors as compared to the integrase inhibitors. Now, when we looked at one-year adherence in this same study in the same cohort, uh, we once again see that uh, in terms of the, the drug regimens, people who were on integrase inhibitors were much more likely to be adherent uh, to their antiretroviral uh, combinations as compared to those on either unboosted or boosted protease inhibitors. And people who were on a single pill were much more likely to be adherent than those who had to take three or more pills on a daily basis, telling us once again that these kind of regimen factors uh, are really play quite importantly in predicting whether or not patients can stick uh, optimally to their regimens. I think it goes without saying that the different antiretroviral uh, drug classes do come with various uh, side effects and toxicities that we understand uh, nowadays quite well. Uh, this is a rather oversimplified uh, look at it, but you know it, it illustrates the fact that we identify or we associate the non the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors or the NRTIs with largely mitochondrial toxicities. Uh, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, especially the first generation ones, like efavirenz, with a lot of uh, neuropsychiatric side effects, and nevirapine, which is a very old drug, not recommended for use in most guidelines anymore, uh, with a high risk of hypersensitivity. But with newer drugs like rilpivirine having some uh, food requirements, uh, we associate the protease inhibitors, I think, uh, they're quite well recognized to have metabolic side effects like hyperlipidemia, uh, as well as gastrointestinal side effects, and of course, uh, at atazanavir having its very characteristic uh, toxicity of hyperbilirubinemia. And even the integrase inhibitor class, which you know, was, uh, was really uh, sort of um, came, on, came onto the scene uh, saying that they had uh, relatively fewer side effects, we are now seeing an increased signal towards weight gain with the use of integrase inhibitors. So all of these medications in, in, in their various combinations may come with numerous side effects that we need to take into account and that may contribute to poor adherence or suboptimal adherence in our patients. The other thing I think that's uh, fairly well recognized by now that can predict adherence is uh, pill burden, the number of tablets that people have to take and the number of times you have to take these tablets in a given day. And we can see that lower pill burden is actually associated with both better adherence as well as with uh, uh virologic suppression. Now, this meta-analysis of uh, randomized controlled trials really uh, investigates the impact of pill burden and once daily versus twice daily dosing on ART adherence and virologic outcomes. And we can see here, in terms of looking at adherence rate, that a higher pill burden uh, was associated with a lower adherence rates and poorer virologic suppression in both the once daily and twice daily group. Now, when we think about um, a pill burden, we also have to consider that some of our patients may be taking many other tablets for other conditions that they may have, uh, so what we term comorbid conditions. And taking other medications also increases the likelihood that some of our patients may encounter drug-drug interactions that may actually cause toxicities or side effects because of these interactions. Uh, in this first table here on the left, we can see that uh, in a survey of numerous uh, uh, cohorts in, 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 in the US, in Asia, and in Europe, uh, that the number of uh, people living with HIV who have diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, 
uh, and other end organ disease like renal disease, cardiovascular disease, and respiratory disorders uh, is really quite significant, right? Depending on which cohort you look at. And in table two, which, I, which I've shown here, uh, the prevalence of polypharmacy of taking five or more drugs that are not to do with HIV in addition to HIV treatments, you know, ranges anywhere from 15% in Uganda all the way uh, to you know, nearly 100%, 94% in this particular study published uh, from the United States. So the problem of comorbidity and polypharmacy and its associated issue of drug-drug interactions is really something that HIV prescribers are going to have to grapple with, especially as our patients live longer, get older, and have more comorbid conditions. Now, the, the last kind of consideration that we need to think about are uh, whether or not our antiretroviral therapies need to be taken uh, with food, without food, what are the food requirements? And you know, I've just sort of highlighted the different drug combinations or drugs that have um, food requirements, including a minimum caloric intake. And we can see, you know, in terms of the individual drugs, drugs like atazanavir needs to be taken with food. Uh, drugs like rilpivirine need to be taken with food and in fact have a minimum caloric intake of four to 500 kilocalories. Some medications like efavirenz, however, uh, should not be taken together with high fat meals and preferably not with food at all. So uh, all of these make uh, dosing timing and dosing frequencies a little bit more complicated for our patients and uh, may affect uh, uh, drug adherence. So really looking at switch strategies now, and I put it to you that we can think about switch strategies uh, uh, in, in, in a certain, in, in, in this pathway that I offer here. If our goal in switching therapy is to improve adherence, then switching can occur because of a stable switch or because of a switch due to treatment failure. Uh, stable switch, of course, is when we switch patients who are already virologically suppressed and preferably stably virologically suppressed. And, uh, you know, when we, before we make this switch, we really have to be quite careful and evaluate and see whether they've got any history, prior history of drug resistance, any side effects and toxicities of the new drug combination or the previous drug combination to compare, uh, whether they've got any comorbid conditions, which we've talked about before. Before we switch, we need to ensure that the new combination that we're switching them to is potent and is going to be effective. And that, of course, uh, means that we need to look at this patient's individual history of drug, res uh, drug resistance and think about the special considerations. In short, all of the reasons that we just talked about just now. Is the new combination more convenient? Are there fewer tablets? Are there fewer side effects? Uh, is it more cost-friendly uh, uh, to the patient? Uh, does it fit the patient's lifestyle more? Now, of course, uh, we do sometimes have to switch therapy because of treatment failure. And uh, in terms of uh, regarding a patient with treatment failure, I think the most important question to ask is whether there is failure with or without drug-resistant virus. Most patients who have evidence of failure without drug uh, resistant virus, uh, the most important thing that we can do is to optimize adherence and to minimize drug drug interactions. And if they are failing with drug resistant virus, then of course, we have to think about whether this patient is failing a first line regimen or has already seen many regimens and is more treatment experienced. And uh, this particular part of the of, the, uh, of this algorithm is beyond the scope of this talk, uh, but I'll be showing you some examples about my thought processes in the uh, switching for other causes. Some of the considerations when we are switching, which may affect adherence, and I think we've talked about this before, looking at side effects, predominantly gastrointestinal and neuropsychiatric side effects, and looking at the pill burden. And here in this slide, I've just highlighted all of the uh, currently available uh, antiretroviral combinations that come as co-formulated single tablet regimens. And of course, uh, while some of them are still uh, NNRTI based with, with uh, things like efavirenz, amtricitabine, and tenofovir uh, disoproxyl fumarate, I think the, uh, the, the future really belongs to the integrase inhibitor based single tablet combinations. Now, in terms of strategies, I think, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, spend too much time looking at these, but just to show you that there are initial as well as follow-up intervention strategies that really have to do with um, 
uh, other factors, so behavioral factors, making sure that patients are ready to be on treatment, making sure that we um, uh, give them assistance uh, in terms of uh, packing pill boxes, engaging their loved ones uh, and their next of kin to remind them to take their tablets and so on. But I want to draw your attention to the medication type strategies. And I think it really highlights all of the points that we've been talking about before. Choosing the simplest regimen possible with the lowest dosing frequency and the lowest number of pills. Choosing a combination that really is um, uh, consistent or that really fits in with the patient's lifestyle, with their ability to take tablets, with uh, work schedules, with school schedules. Choosing medications that have the fewer side effects and that may not have a very complex or complicated food requirements. And of course, medications that don't have drug-drug interactions. Uh, reliance on, on uh, local guidelines is also going to be important. And uh, where I practice in Singapore, uh, the National HIV Program uh, has come up with uh, recommendations for antiretroviral use, uh, specifically looking at the switching of, of regimens. And here, you know, these guidelines, uh, uh, reliable guidelines should tell you uh, when to switch and what to switch to, especially uh, if the, the uh, point is to improve adherence. For example, in our Singapore guidelines, many patients uh, may still be on, uh, on AZT-containing regimens uh, because of historical reasons, and we advise that if adherence is an issue to switch to something that does not require twice daily dosing, for example. Uh, for patients who are taking efavirenz and who experience neuropsychiatric side effects, we recommend either a reduction in dose of efavirenz to the 400 milligram uh, dose based on the results of the on-call one and two trials or to switch to a separate agent altogether. For patients who, who experience side effects and drug interactions from protease inhibitor-based regimens, we recommend either uh, switching to a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor or to an integrase inhibitor-based uh, regimen. And of course, for patients who are on the older uh, nevirapine-based combinations, uh, we recommend a switch out of these, uh, primarily because of the reduction in pill burden and the reduction in dosing frequency. Now, moving from Singapore to a bit more of the uh, uh, newest developments and novel strategies in uh, antiretroviral uh, regimens uh, to improve adherence. And I think other speakers will be talking about two drug regimens as well as injectable therapy. Uh, but you know, I put it to you that these two drug regimens and injectable therapies a uh, whole promise, not just in terms of reduced side effects and, and uh, continued uh, potency, but also that they hold great promise for uh, improving the adherence to antiretroviral therapy amongst uh, people who are living with HIV. When we look at the ATLAS and the FLARE trials, you know, investigating injectable cabotegravir and ropivirine or, or injectable uh, antiretrovirals, we can see that an overwhelming majority of, of patients in both these trials preferred the use of the long-acting intramuscular agents as compared to daily uh, uh, per-oral agents. We can see as well that, uh, you know, in terms of patient preferences, patients tended to prefer <clears throat> long-acting uh, cabotegravir as and, and preferred the uh, eight-weekly dosing as compared to the four-weekly dosing. And the preferred mode of um, uh, ART administration was evaluated uh, uh, in North and South Carolina in this particular study. And there was a great interest in, in the use of injection medications. And we can see that uh, people were very interested in taking either uh, uh, single tablets or uh, even better, uh, implants or injection drugs. And we can assume that this preference, uh, or we would expect that this preference would translate uh, to better adherence as well. Now, having looked at all the evidence and, and told you my strategies and the way I think about uh, um, switching regimens and switching ARTs uh, to improve adherence, I just want to maybe go through very quickly a couple of examples that I've seen in my own clinic. So the first example that I'll go through is a 50-year-old man. Uh, his HIV was diagnosed quite some time ago in 1998 when he presented with a pneumocystis pneumonia. Uh, at the time, uh, one of the very popular regimens that was used was a co-formulated AZT, uh, 3TC, and nevirapine, something, uh, a generic drug that we call locally Z250. This was his first regimen, and he's been quite resistant to changing regimens since then. So he's been on it even up to the current day. He has been virally suppressed right from, you know, soon after starting treatment 
all the way until his most recent test a couple of months ago, when his viral load came back at about 20,000 copies. Thankfully, his CD4 count was still above 200. It was about 300. Now, I found out that he had been seeing his uh, primary physician and he had been started on metformin and glipizide uh, for diabetes. He had been started on valsartan for hypertension and atorvastatin for hyperlipidemia. And, uh, you know, he, he told me that for the first time in the last few months, he's been starting to miss his evening dose of his ARTs more than 50% of the time. You know, he just gotten tired of taking so many tablets. So for this particular patient, you know, we can think about what his problems are. His problems are, first of all, that uh, his current antiretroviral therapy uh, requires twice daily dosing. AZT, 3TC, and avirapine as a co-formulated generic needs to be taken twice a day. This regimen has other problems. It also has significant toxicities, you know, with all the mitochondrial toxicities and hepatotoxicities from these relatively older agents. And it's a low genetic barrier to resistance. We know this for a fact. And poor adherence or suboptimal adherence really puts him at risk of a treatment failure down the line. And in fact, we're starting to see that already. Uh, this patient has also recently been diagnosed with a, with a slew with quite a number of other metabolic diseases requiring treatment and his overall pill burden has increased considerably. He now has to take you know, 11 or 12 tablets a day. So the solution that I offered to him and discussed with him was to switch to a regimen, uh, ART regimen at least, that has a once daily dosing and preferably a single tablet combination. Uh, and you know, the options that we have would include abacavir, lamivudine and dolutegravir or co-formulated tenofovir, elefenamide, amphocytobine, and bictegravir. These integrase inhibitor-based single tablet regimen combinations have a higher genetic barrier to resistance. They're more forgiving. But more importantly, they are, you know, we have reduced his pill burden by half. We have reduced his dosing frequency by half. It's just one tablet with fewer side effects. Uh, but one thing that we need to note, uh, watch out for, of course, is this patient's also taking metformin, and hence uh, we can't... Uh, you know, dose him with metformin doses more than 100 milligrams per day uh, if he's going to be taking dolutegravir. Now, the second example is a 36-year-old woman who was uh, diagnosed with HIV two years ago uh, at another clinic before she transferred over to, uh, to my clinic for care. She was started on tenofovir, disoproxyl, fumarate, uh, lamivudine, and uh, efavirenz at a 600 milligrams once a day dosing at diagnosis. She achieved viral suppression within six months. Uh, but at her latest visit to see me, uh, she's been complaining of poor sleep low mood, anxiety, and in fact has been having nightly hot flushes uh, a couple of hours after taking her, her, her efavirenz, which she takes at night. Uh, and because of these uh, worsening side effects, her mood side effects and these hot flushes that she's experiencing, she admits that she's only been taking her ARTs three to four times a week for the past few months. Her latest viral load you know, has gone from undetectable to about 8,000 copies. Her CD4 count is about 350, and I ran a, a genotype resistance test for her that shows uh, the K103N mutation, which we know is associated with efavirenz use. So the problems for her are that she's got poor adherence to her antiretroviral therapy because of side effects from efavirenz. And we know, of course, that efavirenz has a low genetic barrier to resistance, and poor adherence leads to, uh, to issues. The solutions for her, of course, I want to get her to adhere to her antiretroviral therapy as much as possible to switch to something that has fewer or no neuropsychiatric side effects, to give her a regimen that preferably has a single tablet combination and fewer toxicities. And the option uh, for her here is perhaps to use something like abacavir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir. Uh, but I did want to also be, you know, be, uh, draw your attention to the fact that dolutegravir may sometimes be associated with some neuropsychiatric side effects, namely insomnia, and we do have to follow her up closely for neuropsychiatric complaints. Of course, this isn't the only combination I could have switched to, but in order to, to really give her something that she can take once a day, it's a single tablet, uh, I, I went with this op uh, option. The third and final example is a 60-year-old man with well-controlled uh, high blood pressure. HIV was diagnosed five years ago during a routine insurance check. He was started at the time on tenofovir, amphocytobine, and boosted atazanavir, and achieved virologic suppression quite rapidly. And then he was subsequently switched out. Uh, the, the atazanavir component was switched to rilpivirine uh, to reduce cost. Uh, in Singapore, at least, you know, switching from an atadanavir to a ropivirine-based regimen uh, is a cost reduction of about $150 per month. 
At his last visit, however, he went from being quite virally suppressed uh, to having virologic rebound. He had a viral load of about 1,000 copies, and the CD4 count, thankfully, was still about 500. And on speaking to him a little bit more, I found out that he had recently changed jobs, now working as a security guard in a factory, uh, working shifts sometimes in the day, sometimes at night, with very unpredictable meal times. Uh, and uh, he also is taking his ARTs at very uh, different times of the day from day to day. And he does miss one or two doses of his antiretrovirals once a, uh, per week because he's very tired after work and just forgets to take his medications. So the problem here is that he's got poor adherence because of an unpredictable outcome, uh, uh, routine, sorry. Uh, his meal times are not regular, and we know that his, his last regimen with real pivotry really has quite strict food requirements, right? It needs to be taken after food, needs to be taken with a minimum caloric intake of four to 500 calories per meal, with also a low genetic barrier to resistance, relatively speaking, and a risk of developing resistance. So for this particular patient, uh, I really wanted to switch to something which did not have food requirements, which was not so dependent on him having to take his medications with a full meal. Something that's a little bit more forgiving as well, given the patient's irregular schedule. And so once again, a single tablet uh, combination featuring integrase inhibitors or even a multi-tablet combination featuring a protease inhibitor with a high genetic barrier to resistance like boosted darunavir uh, would be a potential option. But once again, if we're going for something that has a, a, a lower pill burden, one of the integrase inhibitor-based regimens is really what we would look at. So with that, that comes to the end of my, my talk. You know, Just to summarize, we've really looked at what the uh, different uh, uh, factors that go into drug adherence uh, are. We've looked at some of the reasons to switch, a general strategy towards switching if our goal is to improve adherence, and looked at some real-world examples of how switching regimens uh, uh, to, to improve adherence uh, is really, can, you know, really can be thought through and what are the decision-making points uh, that we should bear in mind when, when, when taking this approach. Uh, with that, I thank you, and we'll take questions after this.